The Rise of the Ogre. Episode 1, read by Joss Eckland. Are you sitting comfortably? Prelude. Murdoch Alphonse Nichols stood shaking at the side of the stage. As the line before him grew ever shorter, he knew that the inevitable moment of reckoning was rapidly approaching. He would have done anything to escape this humiliation. However, the only thing he feared more was the wrath of his sadistic father, stood yards behind him, ensuring that the child completed the agreed performance. Money had changed hands, and the deal had to be honoured. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm-hearted welcome to little Murdoch Nichols as the small wooden boy Pinocchio singing, I've Got No Strings. A muted round of applause rippled around the park. There was a moment's silence. Murdoch stood rooted to the spot, resplendent in lederhosen, strap-on nose, and feathered alpine hat, his knees knocking together like a couple of castanets. As the delay continued, the audience started shifting in their seats. A booming voice from the back of the hall broke out, Go on, get over here, my beer's getting cold. His father's thick leathery boot connected hard with Murdoch's backside, hurtling the young child onto the stage. Start singing a little song or I'll smash your teeth in. The bright blinding light shone straight into his eyes as the smell of warm beer, stale cigarettes, and cheap aftershave wafted across the pub. The music started up, and as Murdoch looked to the side, his eyes imploring to be spared this dignity-stripping ritual, his father growled his decision nice and clearly. The local Are You A Star talent contest was the bane of Murdoch's life. Each month, the local pub would hold this type of demeaning event. Talentless clods would enter, impersonating the big names of the day, gurning their way through soul-sapping performance after mindless performance. The prize? Two pounds fifty, and the chance to humiliate yourself further in the biannual county finals. If you were really good, you could then go on to make a cock of yourself on national TV. Boys back to an all-in chorus. Okay, fellas, here we go. Murdoch's dad had often threatened to enter his son into this cattle show purely as another vague opportunity to make some fast dough, and had this month backed his claim. Everything about this made me sick. Remembers Murdoch. Yeah, how these stinky old giffers were sitting in a knackered out pub accepting this crap as entertainment, yeah? Watching talentless people pointlessly impersonating other talentless celebrity stars. Watching my bullying bastard father trying to work this game for cash. None of it worked. And, 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 and listen, you know, if you don't watch it, that's your future right there. Murdoch swore from this moment on never again would he take to the stage under someone else's direction. He would wreak his revenge on this world of buffoons. You could say that was the day that Gorillas was really born, he says now, from that seed of rejection, a rejection of all that kind of rubbish. Murdoch pauses for a moment, reflecting on the long-forgotten memory. He then looks up and says, Actually... I'm gobsmacked you've chosen to open your stupid book with this story. Murdoch Nichols, Spawn of Stoke. Murdoch Nichols was born in the stinking borough of Stoke-on-Trent on June the 6th, 1966. The exact whereabouts have never been verified, but it was rumoured that Murdoch's mother gave birth to him while still in residence at the Belfagor Sanatorium, a halfway house for the sick, the needy, and the incredibly bored. Whatever the truth behind this is, the infant Murdoch was found abandoned upon the doorstep of his nefarious father's house. Murdoch recalls, Oddly, you know, everyone knew who my father was, but no one quite knew who my mother was. Uh, although there was uh, quite a lot of uh, vivid suggestions. Uh, I, I was basically, I was just found as a baby on Sebastian Nichols' doorway one night, when he came home from one of his sessions in the pub. His father, Sebastian Jacob Nichols, or... Jacob Sebastian Nichols, depending on who's asking, was a notorious booze hound, a gambler, womanizer, and ne'er-do-well, a man whose collection of dubious vices would put Bill Sykes to shame. He was thought to have squired a number of children in the area, and had spent most of his ragged life avoiding any form of work one way or another. Auspiciously, upon his return from the pub that fateful night, a filthy black raven stood perched upon Murdoch's swaddling, which should have given Sebastian at least some clue as to the alignment of the contents held within. Sebastian shooed away the oily coughing creature and took this mopped-up bundle inside. One can only imagine the disappointment on his sozzled face when he unwrapped the surprise package. Do you know what? Says Murdoch. I think if eBay had been invented at the time, 
He would have sold me online there and then. As it was, I had to endure years of his boo-sodden, venomous behaviour before he shipped me off to school, which I loathed just as equally. Yeah. I, I'm often asked uh, why my behaviour is so crooked now. It, it's a lot clearer, isn't it, you know, when you see what manky loins I sprung from. Man hands on misery to man, you know. Actually, This Be The Verse would have been a killer song. Yeah. Unfortunately, Philip Larkin never managed to write This Be The Chorus, which is essential for chart success, really. And, of course, uh, it needs to come in within the first 45 seconds, or Radio 1 won't play it. From the age of seven, Murdoch attended Sodsworth Comprehensive School, although from the first day he could frequently be found in the corridors during lessons. His form teacher, Mr. Graveldax, remembers Murdoch with a great deal of warmth, as a scruffy, lovable attendee of the Sodsworth School. Murdoch Nichols remembers Gravelex. No, 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 not him. I hated him. He was an appalling student, whose time was better spent propping up walls outside of the classroom rather than inside, distracting the other pupils with his endless quacking noises and pointless, malicious humour. Although I must admit, even then, he had charisma and a great knack of getting his acquaintances to see things um, the Murdoch Nichols way. He certainly stood out, but... Ultimately, he was a stupid imbecile who often turned up smelling of whiskey. Well... Reckons Murdoch. It's better than turning up stinking of poppers. By the age of 13, Murdoch had a notable reputation around Sodsworth, namely for truancy, puerile pranks, ugliness, poor personal hygiene, and generally unruly behaviour. Despite all this, he was also the target of much bullying, both from the pupils and the teachers. One boy in particular, Tony Chopper, a big, thick, meaty skinhead lump with arms like two wrecks of kebab meat took a pointed dislike to our boy. School bully Tony Chopper remembers him as a creepy little runt. Always stank like an unwashed jam cat. Ball sweat. Chopper reflects. I took a lot of pleasure making his life a misery. Having said that, if I'd known what he was going to become, I'd probably would have acted. Well, a bit different. See, I'm 42 years old now, and I spent last night stuck in shelves and hop shopper. See, what does that make me? Murdoch acquired quite a few names from Chopper. Nerdock, Runt, Reject, Faceache, Oddsock, Wally Bollocks, Trenchfoot, Gaylord, Great Stinking Pile of Horse Dung. The list went on with new ones added daily. It was this protracted period of bullying that eventually made a man of Murdoch. And in the process, Murdoch earned himself the first of eight fractures to his now legendarily wonky nose. Murdoch, tiring of his persecutor, rounded on Tony Chopper, unleashing an unstoppable tirade of razor-sharp wit and bilious venom. This tidal wave of rudeness rose to a crescendo, climaxing with Murdoch informing Mr. Tony Chopper that he was useless, bloated, backward waste of space, who'd probably end up getting a job holding up for sale signs on the corner of streets, only to then get himself fired and replaced by a bucket of soil. Ah, a pissed monkey would stand a better chance in life. <laughs> Pow! Tony's massive porky fist connected with Murdoch's face, shattering his nose and sending the young Nichols boy flying. Success at last! Murdoch had obviously hit a nerve in Chopper, his insults finally penetrating Chopper's thick, stupid hide deeply enough to reduce Tony to a blubbering mound of mindless thuggery. Despite the bloody nose, Murdoch knew he had him licked. That day, Murdoch skipped home merrily from school, the blood rolling down his broken, beaming face. He was on his way. Honing his ability to highlight people's shortcomings gave our intrepid Murdoch a newfound confidence. Most of Murdoch's subsequent teenage years were spent in a boastful riot of larceny, joyriding, animal baiting, fraud and arson, usually while knocking back bottles of strongbow cider and shooting out the windows of houses with his air pistol. After a hard day's miscreant activity, Murdoch would then while away his evenings listening to records around his comrade's house. It was here that, amongst other things, he discovered the deep, dark, dulcet joys of Black Sabbath. The Brummy metal band were a second epiphany for Murdoch, shining a luminous beacon of light through the darkness. Murdoch began to imagine a golden future outside the festering, disease-ridden bubonic hamlet that was Stoke-on-Trent. Black Sabbath's greatest hits collection, We Sold Our Soul for Rock and Roll, was key. Oh, yeah. He recalls. That turned my head right inside out. Yeah. Actually, they were another catalyst for my venture into the old Satanism game. You know. Them, Alistair Crowley, Anton LaVey, and a very ingenious do-it-yourself, 
Acme Satanist kit I bought at a jumble sale. But the very first thing... Uh, see, there was, there was this bloke hanging around the Arndale Centre handing out leaflets, and I, I guess it was the whole riches on earth sort of sexual gluttony coupled with the opportunity for you know, alcoholic excess that first caught my eye. Aged 16, that's a very exciting proposition for a man on the move. So, you know, as a look, I tried it out, and do you know what? It fitted me like a glove. Heavy metal music and devil worshipping became my favourite pastimes. My brother Hannibal's tastes were, were more dub and punk based, but uh, I soaked it all up. Actually, actually, it was my love of the Clash that eventually opened up the world of dub reggae to me. But my first true love was always heavy metal. Lovely, thick, gooey black metal. I don't think my brother liked it at all, though. Ah! Hannibal Nichols broke Murdoch's nose for a second and third time. Ah! The crime this occasion was for playing Dio's We Rock album on Hannibal's personal turntable. He got me into a lot of good music. He says of his brother. He's inside now, though, for, um, oh, I don't know, stealing hubcaps or something. Not long after, Murdoch was pushed out of Sodsworth Comprehensive, leaving with only a single legitimate qualification, an international baccalaureate in antisocial anthropology. Murdoch explains, I'd studied other cultures in quite minute detail their behavioural patterns, the way they communicate, and their, their cultural traditions. And I, and I kind of took the piss out of it. I passed that exam with flying colours. However, the hallowed halls of Stokemon Trent Sixth Form College were never to beckon him further. As he recalls, The combination of my devilish charms, my rapier wit, my love of music, all pointed me in the same direction. I decided, there and then, that I would spend my life as a star musician, sailing the high seas of Chianti, rocking and rolling around the world. I was a genie unleashed. Wit, charm, confidence, charisma became the weapons of my armory, and I was unstoppable. To seal the deal, I, I began making negotiations with the big man below, if you get my drift. I, I knew I had what it takes to rule the airways, but it certainly doesn't hurt getting a little lift up from Beelzebub. So we came to an arrangement. To mark that an agreement had been undertaken, Murdoch changed his middle name via deed poll from Alphonse to Faust. And in return, Murdoch took charge of Satan's own bass guitar, El Diablo. Great sound, really twangy. Murdoch says, explaining its unique appeal. The contract between the two obviously bounced between lawyers for some length, because although the path ahead was now clear, it would be some time before Murdoch Nichols drank from the cup of success. Murdoch went through a variety of low-paid jobs in order to pay the rent required to stay in his father's home. Grave digger, soup seller, telesales, part-time Christmas Santa, even stealing the lead off church roofs. Admittedly, not actually a job, but all the same, he needed the money. How desperate did he get? Well, he says. I did think about giving Sir Alan Sugar a good vigorous tromboning one time. I think a hundred pounds was the agreed sum. Uh, at the last minute, I thought, oh, fuck it, I'm better than that. He was just called Alan at the time. He still made me call him Sir, though. That story's totally true, he maintains. Throughout these years, Murdoch formed many bands with various lineups, none of which seemed to go anywhere. Among these was the terribly amateurish new romantic band Patchouli Clark, a sad, pointless mixture of vaguely gothic keyboards and Murdoch's strangled crow-like crooning. They were never signed. Yeah, whatever. He says now. I always knew I was going to be king of the world at some point, but, you know, it didn't happen with my first band. Big deal. Years upon years passed of unsuccessful attempts to crack stardom. Kilson Makeup, Bullworker, Crimson Backdraft, Motley Dude, the Stupid Name Gang, Durango 95, Two's a Crowd. <laughs> the list of shame goes on. Murdoch explains, Eventually I knew I was wasting my time casting pearls before swine. You know, my voice is, is for the true connoisseur, the, the specialists. And I came to see if I was going to communicate the true brilliance of my songwriting skills to the wide audience that they deserved. And I, you know, I, I was going to have to find someone with a more conventional vocal talent. The fact of the matter is that in 1997, the charts were a joke. You know, these people wouldn't know decent music if it came up and smashed them around the chops. I had a plan that would turn not only the top 40, not just England, not just the music industry, but the whole entire world on its head. Everything. If Murdoch was ever to really realise his dream and escape the dirty, filthy, rotting, garbage-filled, putrid cesspit of Stoke-on-Trent, he was going to have to take his master plan to another level. This meant recruiting a band worthy of his talents. 
Meanwhile, in another part of England, Crawley, Newtown, a much, much better cigar was taking shape. The Rise of the Ogre, Episode 2, read by Joss Ackland. 1, 2, D, 3. In the suburbs, they're spooked. Yeah, I was more into films than music back then. 2D remembers? Like, uh, Mean Time, Scum, uh, Made in Britain. You know what I mean? Uh, plus, I was a big fan of zombie flicks too. Like, I love Dawn of the Dead and Evil Dead and zombie flesh eaters. I was well into Lucio Fulci, the godfather of gore. I really loved his film Zombie and The Gates of Hell too, you know, it was really, really scary. And George Romero stuff was brilliant. I like Cronenberg's Rabbit and, and The Brood. Abel Ferrara's Driller Killer was another really cool film. The Exorcist and Texas Chainsaw Massacre are both great. Well scary. Oh, and uh, Cannibal Massacre, too. But Dawn of the Dead is still probably my favourite. I don't know what it is, but it's just something about zombies. They just really creep me out. You know the way they move really slowly, but they always seem to get you in the end? Really freaks me out. But that's why I watch them, I guess. Yeah. Stewpot, or Stuart Pot to give him his full name, was born on the 23rd of May, 1978 the son of David and Rachel Pott. The Potts lived in a normal, comfortable family home in Crawley, Newtown, or Crawlea, meaning crow-infested clearing, as the original Saxon settlers named it. Stuart was a polite, well-mannered boy with little to say for himself. <laughs> Less charitable people could possibly describe the young Stew Pot as maybe a bit thick. His upbringing, like Stuart himself, was mainly unremarkable and uneventful other than the fact that both he and Murdoch were horses in the Chinese horoscope, they couldn't have come from more separated stock. I know there's a rumour going round that my real name is Stuart Tushpot or something, but that's not true. It's Pot. Stuart Pot. Heh. <laughs> Actually, comments his father, my name was originally Tushpot, but having endured a lifetime of ridicule, I thought around the time of Stuart's birth that I would shorten it to pot. But deep down, both myself and Stu are still Tuspots. Also, despite what Stewpot says, music alongside films had always played a large part in his life. David and Rachel Pot both recall Stuart as an excitable ten-year-old, jumping around his bedroom to noisy backdrop of the jam, the specials, the clash, wire and buzzcocks. Earlier compilation tapes reveal he was also a fan of Jason Donovan, Five Star, Shack Attack, and Stu's favorite artists, the Human League. He was also quite a keen melodica player, crafting simple but memorable melodies on his Hona instrument in the style of his idol Augustus Pablo. When Stuart was 11 years old, he fell out of a tree, landing on his head causing a complete and total loss of bodily hair. When it finally grew back, the natural colour was now a vibrant azure blue. What? Murdoch asks. Collars and cuffs. 2D looks down awkwardly, scratching his head. His father, David, was a mechanic and all-round electronic tinkerer for fairground rides. Stuart's mother was a big-breasted nurse, and it was her who secured the endless supply of painkillers for the terrible migraines that Stuart suffered from. These attacks only got worse after the accident that was to fling Stuart and Murdoch's life together so forcefully in later years. Stuart Putt went to St. Wilfred's School. Coincidentally, the same school that had educated the members of spider-based indie gothfather group The Cure where, despite a marked lack of ambition and apparent limited intellect, Stuart was able to achieve fairly good grades. Well, you know what they say. He reflects. A uh, little knowledge is a wonderful thing. Yeah. I, I hadn't really thought about what I wanted to do after school, though. I never really thought about anything as far as I can remember. I went for a period where I wanted to be a storm chaser and record loads of videos off the TV 
of like tornadoes and stuff. Uh, I like messing about with keyboards and bits of electronics. My dad used to help me customise bits of instruments so that I could make like new keyboard sounds and stuff. We used stylophones, moves, old drum machines, anything electronic that made a noise really. <laughs> uh, I had this uh, Casio VL tone that I thought was well crucial, right? It was just, I was just in the playing around making bloopy noises, being a bit spacey. <laughs> I was a bit into into painting too, messing around with graffiti and stuff. And you know. at one point, I guess I wanted to be a vandal like that bloke Banksy. I only got the Saturday job so I could raise enough to get the Euro '96 Sabutio set. It had all the Euro '96 balls, fences, and players, and a cool-looking box, which was a bit like the USA '94 set box, which itself was a like you know the Italian '90 box. Except they... Meanwhile, back in Stoke, Murdoch had fallen in with many a shady individual, assembling a gang of villainous scoundrels and cronies, all sods to a man. Tired of the endless monotony of dead-end jobs and hopeless rehearsals, he decided to crank up the crime and put his master plan into action. August the 15th, 1997. D-Day. New gear, new singer, new band. That's what I needed. Murdoch recalls. I had a bunch of great songs and demos, and I, and I knew they could tear the charts apart. But I also knew that any song is only as good as the outfit playing them. So I set about assembling a killer band. They had to be the best or no dice. So I, I decided to put it together the easy way. Ram raid the shop, hijack the gear, smash our way into the charts. Grab the chicks and slay the dragon. Get it? So it was while Stu was working as a Saturday boy at Uncle Norm's Organ Emporium, his and Murdoch's world collided, top speed, in a very real way. Murdoch continued, Me and my gang of snaggletooth hardnuts decided that was enough. What we'd do is nick a car, burn it around town, build up a bit of speed, and then launch it right through the music shop window, ram raid styly. Yeah? We could smash some stuff up, get all the latest equipment free, and have a laugh doing it. Yeah. The fact that the car landed on 2D's face, well, you know, the way I see it, that was just a bonus. I remember the day quite clearly, actually. Um, I was standing behind the counter, like, staring into space. I'd probably been in the position for, like, for now, three hours or, or so, just, just standing there. Like, thought Murdoch, some kind of moron. Murdoch comes smashing through the wall of the building in his Vauxhall Astra, which lands bumper first on the side of my head. Happy days. That's when your eye came out, wasn't it? it yeah, the first one, uh, it didn't come out. It was pushed inward, fractured. God, that did hurt. By driving a stolen Vauxhall Astra through the building and directly into Stewpot, Murdoch had permanently damaged Stewpot's left eye, also putting him into a deep catatonic state. Murdoch. You were just a vegetable instantly. If I hadn't been laughing so much, I probably would have heard the cops pulling up outside. Murdoch was arrested and sentenced to 30,000 hours of community service plus ten hours every week of caring for the vegetabilized stewpot. God bless the British justice system, eh? Unbelievable. They put me in charge of you. It was a bit of a drag, but you know, we used to have a lot of fun during those sessions. You wouldn't remember that, though. You were just a comatose plank, really. Actually, now I think about it, it was like looking after a bag of cement. Murdoch's care in the community service usually involved as much mistreatment of the deaf, dumb and blind Stuart Pot as Murdoch could squeeze into his appointed time slot. Kicking, slapping, punching, dragging, dunking, catapulting, nothing seemed to affect the catatonic kid. Until one incident went a little bit too far. We were in a car park in Nottingham. And I was pulling a whole load of very snazzy 360-degree donuts. Uh, I had a proper burn on. I was getting some good smoke off the tyres. The girls that were standing around, they were really impressed. So, you know, I just thought I'd take it up a notch. Yeah. Took my foot off the brake and went for a grand finale. 
I was probably hitting about 90 when 2D got catapulted through the windscreen. He flew about 500 yards, landing face first on a curb. Um, whoops. Really? Where is 2D? Yeah, yeah, that's when your second eye went. Yeah. But it, you, you flew through the windscreen at about 70 miles an hour, landing on your head once more, and you, you skidded on your face for about half a mile, but... You know what? When you came round, my God! The impact of the accident had revived Stupart from his state of paralysis, and in doing so, gave us one of the greatest front men the world has ever seen. He stood up really slowly. Murdoch remembers. His back was still towards me, and really slowly turned around like one of the zombies in those films he watches. And there were no eyes, just two black holes. A vacant stare. Oh, it looked great. A blue-haired, black-eyed god. The girls would go wild. I, I knew I had it. But you were still a bit mental. But I had my front man. Despite the mess, and the fact that half your face was hanging off, I could see that the girls would go crazy for his pretty boy looks. So, I made him the gorilla singer, yeah. How could you not? There he stood before Murdoch, love's young deity, whippet thin, spiky, deathly white pallor, black hole eyes, awkward and angular, like a speed-ridden corpse with grade eight keyboard skills. Perfect. Murdoch recruited the newly revived, albeit still mentally defective, Stewpot as the keyboardist and vocalist for his group, renaming him 2D in honor of the two dents that he now sported in his head, scars left by the twin Murdoch-induced car accidents. Now he needed a drummer, the backbone of any great outfit. Next stop, Soho. Extracted from The Rise of the Ogre by Gorillas, published by Penguin Books. The Rise of the Ogre. Episode 3. Read by Joss Ackland. Russell Hobbs. Awaking the Slumbering Giant. My first encounter with Murdoch was really when the bag went over my head. He asked me for some obscure 50s record, and I turned around and looked for it. I was working behind the counter at Big Rick Black's record shack in the London Soho area. I had my back turned to him for just a moment. That's when he slipped the sack over my head and bundled me out of the shop. It wasn't until it came off, I found myself at Palm Studios, and Murder Nichols was my assailant. But the music he played me was good enough to keep me there. Enter Russell Hobbs, the hip-hop hard man from the U.S. of A. If 2D was the looks, Murdoch the brains, then Russell truly was the heart. While Murdoch and 2D were into music, this dude Russell was a musician whose knowledge of sound spanned the globe. Trouble, however, had always followed Russell Hobbs around. I, you see, I heard about this hip-hop maestro Hobbs, says Murdoch, a one-man rhythm king who'd been possessed by the ghosts of his dead friends. I mean... Come on, you know, how much press is that going to get you? Yeah? I mean, he's got everything, isn't it? Hip-hop, the undead, rapping spirits, deportation, and a devastating drummer all rolled into one big royalty check. No, baby, the second I heard about Russell Hobbs, I knew he was going to be in my band, whether he liked it or not. Russell, born in Brooklyn, New York City, June the 3rd, 1975, had been sent to England for his own safety, after all of Russell's friends were suddenly gunned down one night in a drive-by shooting. He recounts the tale in his deep, slow, East Coast drawl. It's all so vivid. The sound of the car coming around the back of us. Me and my friends were parked outside a 7-Eleven store. It rang real hard. We mind our own business, you know. The Humvee, the big black Humvee, kind of crawled around the back of the vehicle. And we just knew this was trouble. Go on, what happened next? That's too deep. Murdoch looks at 2D and rolls his eyes. 2D's heard this story 50, 60 times, and Murdoch knows it. He throws a hefty phone book at 2D, hitting him squarely on the back of the head. Oi! Rain Man, why don't you go and memorize this? Hmm. Getting Russell to go through this again was like sitting in on some tedious old farts therapy session. Gangbangers. 
Russell continued. The truck was full of them, all wearing red hoodie tops, apart from one. His hoodie was black, the face completely in shadow. Then we noticed the barrel tips, just poking through the window. They opened fire and the night sky was ablaze. The gunfire from the Uzi just lit up the place. My friend Dale died instantly. The others, well, were died apart from me. For some reason, the bullets never hit me. Hmm. That does really strange. Now, you may have noticed that actually a lot of what happens to us isn't exactly normal, moron. Slaps Murdoch. Russell's still with the story. But from where I lay on the floor of the truck, I could see his face. The one with the black hood. It was Death himself, incarnate. The Grim Reaper. Yo, that image is gonna stay with me forever, dog. Immediately, that's when all these spirits that go to my dead departed friends all entered my body. Like they was being sucked up, like sheets being sucked up into a vacuum cleaner. Bam, bam, whoosh, bam, straight into me. The process of possession turned Russell's eyes a permanent frosted milky white. It also gave Russell his exceptional music skills, the friends in question being the ones he'd made after his first brush with the demonic underworld, all musical supremos to a man. Dale, he was my true soulmate, my friend, my brother. When he was killed, his spirit took residence inside me. He became the ghost rapper who appeared on the Clint Eastwood record. But I've always been a receptacle for wayward spirits, demon apparitions. Well, Russell... Chirps Murdoch. That's probably because of the size of vacant real estate you offer? I think it's more that I guess I kind of vibrate at that frequency. You what? I originally used to go to private school in New York, the Xavier School for Young Achievers. But I was removed from there by the faculty governors after an incident in which some of the other graduates were horribly mauled. Unknown to me at the time, I was already possessed by a demon, and a big one too. One night in the campus dormitory, apparently I swelled up to twice my size and went on a rampage, picked up some of the kids and threw them around like dolls. I wouldn't have believed it was me if I hadn't seen that Russell Hobbs was his sign, scrawled in blood in the school hall. It was definitely my signature. Murdoch is shaking his head. I... Oh, you're such a crackpot, Hobbs, you know that. Take it easy, Muds, or I'm gonna pound your Brooklyn style. Anyhow, I was expelled from school, but the possession and anxiety sent me into a coma. I was unconscious for about four years until Father Mary exercised a demon from my soul. That's when I came round. The demon finally vanquished. Russell came to after four years in the comatose state. Unfortunately, his old school refused to take him back. That's when I went to Brooklyn High School and met my new crowd. There were student musicians, rappers, DJs, and MCs. I learned so much so fast. Hip-hop saved my life, my soul. But this honeymoon period was not the last. The drive-by massacre not only killed his crew, but also sealed his fate. His parents shipped him off to England, to his uncle's home in Belsize Park, and to what they imagined would be a relative safety. I was sent here to convalesce, to recover and unwind. But uh, you didn't count on me tracking you down, though, did you, mate? Oh, hey, hey Russ, uh, didn't think that would happen, did you? Among Russell's personal belongings that were shipped over was one that was to become a mainstay of the Gorilla's sonic arsenal, the legendary hip-hop machine. That box contains every beat known to man. Things are replaceable. It's the TARDIS of the hip-hop world. Its rhythms span both time and history right across the universe. Never mess with that machine. It'll eat you whole. As the big man says, the machine is a towering hybrid of every drum machine, beatbox, rhythm track, breakbeat, and sample ever created. The fact that it also contains the souls of many drummers that roll endlessly around its circuits, well, you can see why the box is so highly coveted. Now, you can't buy that kind of equipment out of the back of Exchange and Mart, can you? With the inclusion of Russell in the band, Gorilla's stock became boosted no end. He brought with him a love of hip-hop, funk, dub, world music, kraut rock, and more. From big band, bluegrass, and booty bass, to jazz, ska, white noise, and reggae, his knowledge was infinite. More than this, his education and schooling in New York brought an understanding of the arts and literature, a tuition that spanned Busted to Basquiat to Bukowski. It's an overused term, but it would be possible to describe Russell as a true Renaissance man. Though I'm, um, not, not sure exactly what that really means. It pertains to the Renaissance period, 
where a gentleman was expected to have a whole breadth of knowledge and talents in a wide range of fields. Unlike polymaths, who are people who excel in many fields, I'm a cross between the two. I'm a jack of all trades, but a master of drums. What more could you ask for? A decent guitarist. And the only weak link did appear to be Paula, the guitar player. Well, uh, Paula was the girl who played guitar for us early on. The 2D had been seeing her. But she, well, it didn't really work out in the band, you know. After Russell joined the band, Paula, 2D's girlfriend at the time, was drafted in to play guitar. But one night, Russell found both Murdoch and Paula up to no good together in the toilet at Kong. Cubicle number three, I seem to recall, says Murdoch. For this gross act of disloyalty, Russell broke Murdoch's nose a further five times, giving us the grand total of eight fractures that afflict his mangled hooter today. Paula Cracker, Gorilla's first guitarist, tells her side of the story. Well, I've been seeing Stu Pot for about two months. I played a bit of guitar and used to buy strings from the shop he worked in. He was very sweet. A bit thick, though. He said that he was going to be a singer in this band, yeah? They didn't have a name yet. And I thought, yeah, I heard it all before. Still, I went down to Kong Studio to check him out, and I ended up playing with them. But when I saw Murdoch, with his thick, greasy hair, green teeth and yellow skin, I thought, ooh, he's the one for me. Paula becomes increasingly more animated. Maybe she's on some sort of medication. Oh, he's such a dandy, like Errol Flynn or something. But after that thing in the toilets, they kicked me out, bastards. But I never heard from Murdoch again, and my purse was gone. Since then, they've become this big, massive band. So I guess I was pleased for them. But it also kind of makes me feel really, uh, sick. In the head. Like I want to hurt people. They tried to write me off the story of gorillas, but I was the guitarist way before that noodle. I've got half a mind to hunt them down and start screwing with their heads. I think she is on medication. 2D seems hurt. I can't believe you did that, Murdoch. Ah, I did you a favour, mate. She was a rubbish-looking bird. Seriously, she looked like Grayson Perry or something. The best shot of her. You are. It, it's just a principle. Look, she was depressingly ugly. Easily enough to put you off your dinner. I mean, you should thank me. <laughs> Anyhow, on with the show. So where were we? Oh, yes, one step forwards, another one back. The still embryonic gorillas needed to find that missing link. Time to think fast. In time on a tradition, Murdoch placed an ad in the back pages of the weekly musical institution that is the NME. I read the wordings for the advert down the phone. Recalls Murdoch. Global phenomenon, seek guitarist for world domination, blah, 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 GSOH required. No hippies, etc., etc. Uh, no sooner had I put the phone down, there was a knock at the door. I opened the door... And no one there. In the deserted hallway stood only a ten-foot-high freight container marked FedEx. Murdoch pushed the crate into the middle of the room, when out from the box sprung Noodle. All three foot two of her. I've, I've got to admit, I, I wasn't really expecting that, says 2D. Uh, we heard a knock at the studio door, and there's this big box there, and out jumped a small Japanese person, carrying a Les Paul. I couldn't make out a word she was saying. It's just gibberish. But then she unleashed a massive guitar riff, what sounded like 200 demons screaming in Arabic. It was brilliant. She ended it with a 20-foot-high karate jump. She bowed and just said one word. Noodle. That was it. The position was taken and my group was complete. I, you could feel electricity running right through the four of us. Actually, I took great joy in telling all the other knobheads who turned out for the job to sling their hooks. The band changed their name to Gorillas. A legend is born. We weren't really Gorillas uh, until Noodle arrived. Corrects 2D before Murdoch puts us straight. Well, yeah, we went through quite a lot of names. You know, I thought... You know, seeing as musically I wanted to swing through the jungle bearing my ass, I, I just thought Gorillas was the perfect name. Noodle was the spirit and the joy. Even her amnesia and total lack of knowledge of her past could not cause a ripple to the joyful approach she took to life. Her presence perfectly balanced the exceptional individual components of this extraordinary group. Russell argues, Despite the language problem, you picked up pretty fast and Noodle was into music in a real way. She fitted right in. Her guitar skills were phenomenal, and she gave off pure love. The fact that she had the ability to laugh at Murdoch really helped, too. Gorillas are alive. And so do work. The band embarked on relentless series of rehearsals, working deep in the belly of Kong. They cemented their sound almost immediately, recording themselves as they went. 
the very first track to materialize was an exhilarating gem named Ghost Train, a runaway juggernaut of a track and proof positive of the undeniable magic that this foursome possessed. Based around a sample from the Human League Sound of the Crowd, and featuring some incomprehensible rap from 2D, the track was an absolute barnstormer, and enough to get the major labels salivating uncontrollably. I ran down to Snappy Snaps, bought a disposable camera, I fired off a couple of pics of the band, uh, put them, the Ghost Train track, and a quick manifesto together, I posted the package off to Smithia over at EMI. I, I included a little note, you know, just to let him know that we were coming. And in the note, it said, Don't be a mug all your life. If you bungle this, you're going to feel like a dick. I've booked a gig. Do yourself a favour and get yourself down there. Yeah. I'm throwing you a rope here, Sonny. Don't louse it up. Sign us up and you can sit on your ass for the rest of your life. Yeah, well, you know what I mean. You know, you've got to set your stall up early, haven't you? Establish the relationship early on. I was right. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Gorillas were to become the assassins of useless celebrity. A line was finally being drawn, and these people had to decide which side of it they wanted to be on. Embrace the future, or drown in the past. Your choice. It did seem to do the trick. The phone started ringing immediately. Things were really picking up. Every day was just another uh, brilliant day. I met this girl from S Club 7, uh, Rachel Stevens, and we started going out together. She was really nice. What does the S stand for? <laughs> 2D throws a look over to Murdoch. Murdoch winks. 2D looks down. More trouble, no doubt. I don't know, but anyway, I invited her down to the gig we were doing at the Camden Brown House. It was our first gig, so we were going to pull out all the stops. The Camden Brown House was a notorious venue that every no-hoper and junior never will be always played. But gorillas were different. Even on their first gig, the energy and confidence were spectacular. Heavy-duty welding glasses were handed out at the door for the audience's own safety. To stare directly at the blazing sensation of gorillas in full flow was to take one's eyesight in your own hands. They were that brilliant, see? The Rise of the Ogre Episode 4 Read by Joss Eklund. November the 5th, 1998. Gorillas play the Camden Brown House. This is their first concert as the Gorillas lineup we now know and love. The gig is a barnstormer. Murdoch had loaded the evening up front, already putting in the call to A and R man, Whiffy Smithy at EMI. Sign us at our first gig, man. It'll be great press for both of us. The kids will think some kind of phenomenon, phen 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 some kind of movement's happening. Oh yeah, do something wicked that'll get us noticed. Whiffy Smithy was an old hand at the music game, and despite signing the odd clunker, this was a man who could take a Pepsi challenge and come out sipping Cristal. When it came to bands, he knew his onions. Uh, as soon as they uh, played punk, uh, I, uh, I knew I'd seen uh, the future of music. It um, hit me, um, hit me on the face like a wet kipper uh, against a shed door. Uh, uh, other other labels uh, had come down to check these uh, gorillas out, uh, but I put my uh, double-barreled friend, the negotiator, down with me. Uh, uh, no, uh, no contest. <laughs> There was a riot match. Whiffy, with inimitable style, let off a few rounds from his pump-action sawn-off, forced his way through the crowds, and grabbed those all-important signatures. Gorillas were signed. One gig, one song. November the 6th, 1998. The Gorillas record label signing party. For the signing party, the record label pulled out all the stops, with no expense being spared. It was a very decadent bash, and... Murdoch makes the point. For me, that's saying something. They hired a palace and sort of decked it out like a baroque bordello. Some bird with three knockers jumped out of a cake. Vodka you know, flowed like Niagara Falls. A couple of tigers on roller skates had been thrown into the mix to keep things, you know, sort of exotic. They also presented us a check for the advance. And 
Kelly, they gave us one of those really big, super-sized checks on cardboard or whatever it is. I, I, can't, I can't tell you how much of a dick I felt carrying that down to Barclays. Although at least I can say I, I didn't lose it. Yeah, well, how could I? It's enormous. <laughs> The evening gradually faded into a food fight, one so violent that 2D had an eclair pushed hard enough into his face to knock his tonsils out. However, the evening wasn't a total waste of time that these events so often are. Smithy had brought along some old-school backup. Okay, gorillas were good, really, really good. But there's no harm getting a little extra guidance when it comes to crunch time, eh, listeners? Mr. Whiffy introduced us to Damon Alban, 2D recalls, the singer from the British band Blur. Him and Murdoch didn't really get on immediately, due to the kind of competitive one-upmanship they both display. The first thing Damon said to Murdoch, pointing down at his boots, was, Your Cuban heels are crap. Look, mine are the proper sort. Damon was wearing a pair like Murdoch's, but with solid silver heels and big fancy gold spurs. I think Murdoch was a bit humiliated. He's very proud of his shoes. However, Gorillas and Alban swiftly became close friends, bonding over a mutual love of great music, coupled with a shared Genghis Khan-like sense of ambition. His support and input, despite what Murdoch maintains, has been an invaluable asset to Gorillas from the outset. He became a paternal figure, sometime producer, and an ingenious fixer for the band. It was his knowledge of the industry that without a doubt helped gorillas avoid some of the more obvious pitfalls. Murdoch, however, once again had more pressing matters to attend to that evening than hanging out talking about music. Mr. Nichols had his thieving magpie eyes on 2D's new belle, the lovely young chanteuse, Miss Rachel Stevens. He spent most of the evening lulling and beguiling her with his magical, intoxicating mantra. I go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. Oh, go on. Finally, when she could resist his potent charms no more, she threw her drink in his face and stormed out. I... Two uh... D and Rachel split up the next day due to Murdoch's incessant pestering. Stewpot, she explains, that's Trudy's real name, um, well, we were deeply in love, well, I mean, uh, I still do love him, but, um, it's, it's just that Murdoch, every time Trudy's back was turned, he was like trying it on with me, and it kind of just ruined our relationship, you know, and actually it ruined a couple of my t-shirts, come to think of it. Having banked the seven-foot check, Gorillas wasted no time in decking out that con studio shell with the high-tech super slick junk that you can see there today. Spazzed to the max, Gorillas undertook the enviable task of recording the world's greatest debut with themselves at the helm. As Murdoch explains, Well, you know, if the ship crashes, uh, there's no one else to blame but ourselves. It suits me fine. November the 31st, 1998. Gorillas commenced recording of the album at Kong Studios. Whiffy set Murdoch, 2D, Russell, and Noodle to task. Give me the goods, he told them, and I'll do the same for you. Agreed? Eh, uh, all right, Smithy. Says Murdoch. You know, no need to sound all dramatic. That's what we agreed by signing the contract, surely. To keep your stupid ginger wig on, mate. I'm about to blow your mind. Gorillas knocked out 40 tracks, then cut them down to 15 mini masterpieces. The buzz around Gorillas was spreading through the music world like wildfire. The new kids on the block were hot, and everyone knew it. Despite every attempt to keep things under wraps until it was finished, the first in a long line of superstar collaborators popped round to borrow some sugar from the residents of Kong Studios, and ended up appearing on the album. The first up to the batter's mound. Miho Hattori confirms Russell, the Japanese singer from Chiba Mato. She harmonized with Noodle on the vocals for Rehash. The track became the opener for our debut album. Now might be a good point to go into the history of Kong Studios, the fantastic Willy Wonka-type cathedral of crap that gorillas live in. 
How the hell did Murdoch ever acquire such a grand decaying palace of sin before gorillas even sold a single record, huh? Well, we hear here now from the man himself, here. Uh, I've been the thesaurus for a second, I'll tell you what happened. I was up late one night, scouring the internet. I was living in a freezing bedsit at the time. The heating had broken down, and I was looking at a site about, I don't know, dodgy boilers. Uh, anyway, I, I came across this website called Gigantic Disuse Haunted Studios in the Middle of Nowhere.com. The owners were looking for an off season caretaker to look after the place during the winter. You know, they said in the ad they'd be back in six months. But I got the impression that they were trying to get rid of the place for good. And when I turned up at the interview, obviously the only applicant, they chucked the keys at me and then ran off down the hill screaming. Yeah? I just looked at the place and thought, wow, I'm home. You can make as much noise as you like here. I used the place as a studio base initially where we put gorillas together, but it became our home, our headquarters, and also the online gateway between us and our fans. Right from very early on in Gorilla's career, we made sure that people you know, had access to the joint. By hooking up cameras in every room, people could check out what was going on at Kong Studios via the website gorillas.com. The website, Gorillas.com, has been incredibly well received, winning many awards for its innovative and pioneering approach. From the date of its launch to the present day, Gorillas' website received more hits than all the other acts on the band's record label combined. We filled the place up with games, toys, videos, and many interactive elements, adds Noodle. We created message boards where our audience members and people who entered the website could talk to each other. We tried to be as creative and all-embracing as the technology would allow. We even left tapes and samples of our music lying around, allowing people to mix their own versions. 2D adds a note of caution. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's all very cool, but I'm a bit bothered about the number of people that can go into our bedrooms and touch our stuff. I think that's weird, really. Between the 1st of June 2005 and the 1st of June 2006 alone, over 82 million rooms and games were visited at the site. And in June 2006, Gorillas were awarded Webby Artists of the Year. That is, well, it's a bit like your house winning an Oscar. Russell continues, Nearly every aspect of Gorillas is documented and archived here at Kong and Gorillas.com. Our videos premiere online, we mail out all the info about what we're up to, we've run competitions from the site. It's endless. This odd, spooky building continues to grow daily as new sections are constantly added, but its dark past and rent-free ownership remained a mystery. Until one night, Noodle discovered the truth behind this haunted hilltop hellhole. Deep in the bowels of Kong. Noodle came across an archive library room where she learned the terrible legend of Kong Studios, a building with a checkered history that stretches far back. Prior to any construction, the original site was a druid's meeting point, picked specially for its unique alignment of dark energies and hideous ley lines. Various members of the Goat Clan would converge on the Essex Hilltop site at certain points in the lunar cycle and inhale vapors while tunelessly chanting into makeshift cauldrons. The first Kong building was erected on top of an old disused cemetery. Many of the people who died in the Great Plague of 1665 were dumped there in shallow graves and burial pits. Ugh. The Kong Mansion, which still stands today, was built in 1749 to house the decadent Hellenist, Sir Emery Kong a giant barking brute of a man who would host the debauched sadistic meetings of his King Kong Club. Having satisfied their more physical desires, he and his fellow club members would sit around talking rubbish far into the night. It is said that his ghost still wanders around Kong kitchens in the early hours, moaning in deep haunting tones for a glass of water. The current building is also situated next to one of the biggest landfill sites in the country. It's not just fridges, washing machines, and tractor tires. We're talking about old nappies, colostomy bags, mad cows, and rotten alien torsos. In the middle of summer, when the heat rises, 
The stench that oozes up through the soil from this pit is unbelievable. Like someone cooking turds or something. Prior to gorillas, the most recent owners were a bunch of Hell's Angels, a biker gang who called themselves the Nomads, who used the building as their clubhouse. One night back in 93, they held a massive party and invited Hell's Angels from all over the Midlands. The local police chief reckoned there must have been nearly 2,000 bikers crammed into the hangar room of basement number three. However, when some of their meth-drinking frolics went haywire, a fire started. Someone had locked the main doors so no one could escape. They all got burnt to a crisp. Murdoch explains the appeal. Kong Studios is so stuffed full of dead stuff, bad karma and sick vibrations, it's no wonder that the place lay vacant for so long, you know. It was in the September of 98 when the fledgling but aging rock star Murdoch Nichols picked the keys up and from that day forward, Gorillas and Kong were married together eternally. Bargain! Ah, Kong Studios can do strange things to a man. Eh? Seems to be a magnet for weirdness, the paranormal, the malcontent, and me. It has an effect on everyone who enters. Seriously, you know, check the place out. It's, it's full of these freaks. Apparently, one night, Lenny Kravitz turned up and rested his balls in the face of a gay polar bear. I love this gaff. It makes Batman's place look shit. Although the weather's always pretty grim around here. Always. So much of the gorilla's entire existence has been played out at Kong Studios, a grease noodle. It has been a pivotal part of our lives. It seems sometimes like the building is impossible to escape from. But more of that later. Let's get back to the main story. Where were we? Oh, yes. The gorillas are just about to make their first album. Extracted from the rise of the ogre by gorillas, published by Penguin Books.